I'm so excited about this Vital Signs series, and I hope you're ready for it. And uh, we're going to be turning to the book of James. If, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in the New Testament, somewhere to the right of, of the halfway mark in the book. You'll find it back there somewhere, uh, hopefully. Uh, I'll give you a page number here shortly. James is the brother of Jesus. Did you know that? He's a stepbrother. Now, here's the deal. Jesus uh, was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary, so he doesn't have the same father uh, because God the Father conceived him through the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. James was conceived by Joseph with Mary, and uh, so they're stepbrothers. Uh, but what's really kind of fascinating is that James got to see Jesus grow up. He, he got to experience it all with him. Can you imagine the, like the brother thing going on? Like you've got brothers, right? You know how this thing goes. And uh, the, all, all the things happening and getting to see his life all the way through. Interesting, James is probably the oldest of the, the brothers of Jesus. Jude is also, you'll find he has written a book in the Bible. He's also listed as a brother of Jesus. And uh, what's fascinating is that James did not always believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Like, let's, if your brother says, I'm the Messiah, how would you react? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just, just saying. So, so, that's, so that's what's going on. And James doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He struggles with that. In fact, all the brothers do. Look what it says in this passage. I want you to see James' transformation as we dig into this book. It said, when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, can you feel the sarcasm dripping from these words? Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works that you do. No one who wants to become a public fig figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers do not believe in him. James, they grew up with him. Your brother can't be the Messiah, can he? Like, like they knew he was different, but, but like, if you're really Messiah, you go out and do something. If you're really Messiah, you go out and do miracles. You, you're just living with us. And something changes all that. Now, now what is it? What, what changes James' mind? Because I'll just tell you, James wouldn't write the, the book that he wrote unless something had changed. I'll tell you what changed. Jesus went to a cross, and he died on the cross. Now, a lot of people had died on the cross. That was the Romans' favorite way of executing people. So that alone, he paid the price for our sins, but that alone, like, wait a minute. But he was buried, and after three days, he rose again. That's the deal. That's the difference. You see, that changed everything for James. A lot of people died on the cross. A lot of people had been buried, tracking so far. A lot of people do that. There's only one in all history who was raised from the dead. And I want to say to you today that if you're, if you're here saying, well, there's a lot of gods out there, and I'm not sure which one to pick. I'm not sure which way to go, and i got to put my hope in something. What should I pick? Pick the one who can raise himself from the dead. You know what I'm saying? James, the brother of Jesus, that's, that's what he did. He, he saw what Jesus did, and he said, okay, wait a minute. There's something different about him. And I want you to know the book of James, as we dig into this book, it's proof that James really believes that Jesus is who he says he is. He died later on in his life. Part of it was because he wrote this book. Part of it is because he, he became a leader in the early church, and he was willing to die for what he believed. You don't die if you don't believe it. James believed. He, he grew up with Jesus. He saw this death and resurrection. He began to realize Jesus, he's who he says he is. And I'm not believed, but I believe now. And he believed so much, he was willing to give his life. How many of us would die for something we don't believe in? Well, I want you to know that's, that's the power the book of James has for us because, because God has given it to us so that we will believe as well. And so he writes this book. It's kind of like a New Testament uh, wisdom book. You know, there's some wisdom books in the Old Testament, like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and we can go on. But I want you to know that some people think the, the, the book of James is kind of like this letter to the 12 tribes, and it sort of is. But in, in some sense, it's more of a wisdom book. You see, you and I need wisdom, the, the, the simple, practical skills of living in a, in a world that's in chaos. How do we do that? Well, that's where James comes in. You see, the people in that day in this early church are being persecuted, like things are going south. And James is written at a time, it's probably written about 55 AD. We, we can quibble about dates, but it's in that range. So here's the deal. Jesus dies about 32 AD. You know, he's 
That, that's when he's crucified. And about 55 or so, 60, 50, what, somewhere in there, James writes this book to the early Christian church. He's one of the first, he, he's one of the first to actually take uh, uh, what God had inspired him to write and put it on paper. And uh, Galatians, I think, is one of the others. Many of the, the works that you read in the New Testament, they were written about 40 to 50 years after Jesus had died. So, so probably in the 60 to 90 A.D. time frame, a lot of this is written. But James is written, and it's written at a time where believers need to hear, how, how do we do this? How, how do we go through this life? when there's chaos, when there's destruction, when, when difficult times are happening, when we go through the trials. And so James writes into that kind of situation, into, into the church. And, uh, and he gives us a vital sign. He gives us some vital signs for how to know if you're living the way God wants you to and, and, and if you're approaching things the right way. And he gives some practical prescriptions then to live out. My mom was in the hospital, I probably told you this, uh, a few months back, and uh, it, was a, it was a difficult time. She had her leg amputated, and uh, it was touch and go. We almost lost her four or five days. She was in ICU. And, you know, I go to the hospital a lot, and, uh, but I have never seen someone hooked up to so many monitors and IVs. And, I mean, there were cart after cart with all the, they even had to combine like these little cords into one to get it all in her veins because they, they couldn't find enough. I mean, it was that that was that crazy. They were monitoring everything. They, they were on her, her oxygen level, her pulse, her heart rhythm, uh, her beats per minute, all that kind of good stuff. Um, blood pressure. And then they would take blood every so often, and they were checking her, her uh, calcium levels and her potassium levels, her proteins and her enzymes. I mean, whoosh, all these vital signs. They had a screen in the room. They had a screen on the door right as you come into the room. They have one at the nurse's station. I mean, they monitored everything. And it's a good thing because there were some moments where things started beeping and going off and people come rushing and there were issues. And they had to work on her. And the vital signs were the things that gave them the warning about where things were going so they could act in appropriate ways. They could steer her health in the right way. And so that's what they did. They, they worked this vital sign for her. That's the book of James for you and me. You see, if you want to grow spiritually, there are some vital signs that we better monitor to see which way we're going. Are we living the way God's called us to live? And so James, in this very practical sense, gives us prescriptions for how to live, but through that, we can discover the vital signs for an active, growing faith. And today, we're going to look at the vital sign of joy. How does joy tie into trials? They almost seem contradictory, and yet... James says joy is an indicator of if you're working through the things in life that are so difficult. And, and how is that all tied to wisdom? I, I've been amazed this week how God has just opened my eyes to see things that maybe I've not seen before. Th there was a, a study done called 178 Seconds. 178 seconds, what they did was they took 20 airline, not airline, airport, airplane pilots, so just pilots in, in, in small planes, and they put them in a simulator. Simulator looked just like a complete cop, cockpit, like you were in the cockpit of an airplane, and they, put, they could put all these different scenarios in, and these were 20 pilots who could fly in the daytime, or in the night, but in clear weather, like there wasn't any bad weather, no clouds, no fog, all that, and they put those 20 pilots in that, in, in that simulator, and they ran them through all these different scenarios, and guess what? They were skilled, trained pilots. They did great. Then they threw in some weather. They threw in some really bad weather, stuff that they weren't trained for, stuff that they had, didn't really understand how to deal with fog and clouds they couldn't see and in only 178 seconds every one of those 20 pilots crashed you and I we're good when things are flying smooth when we're out of the clouds and, and we can see the future we can see the horizon we we kind of know where life's going and and we got it we got it we feel like we're good and then when the clouds come 
I, I was in the military, National Guard, and when we started out, I was a combat engineer. We just blew stuff up, which was fun. But then we moved into the M1 tank. This is not the M1, by the way, but it's a tank. And uh, when we moved the M1 tank, we had to go to this training school to learn how to run the tank and, and to fight with it and all the systems. And then I went to tank commander school to learn how to, to manage all the crew of the tank and coordinate with other uh, commanders. And then we, 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 we got back to our unit, and we, went, we had this simulator, and we could spend time in the simulator just like those airline pilots, and we would, like, work the tank. We would fight these different scenarios, learn how to use the systems, and we got pretty good at killing the enemy. It was us and them, and we, we, we got really pretty good about how to handle all these targets. Then they took us to Fort Knox to this simulator training, and we went into this nondescript warehouse, just row after row after row of simulators, tank simulators. Like the whole place was full of them. That was before, I was never a video gamer, but you video gamers eat your heart out. Like we were doing the real deal here. Like what, you would put all four right into that, into that simulator. And there, were, you're, there were four tanks in a platoon. So we had four people in one tank, and you had four tanks in one platoon, and then you had four uh, groups of that for a company, and then we had our whole battalion there. So you can imagine the number of people independently moving parts, and everybody could see everyone else, and the enemy did their own thing, right? You, know, you can't predict that. And we thought we had it all figured out back in our little simulator, but we got in there. We didn't make it 178 seconds, and we were dead. <laughs> so often, we think we got it all figured out. And then the clouds come in. And then all these moving parts start to happen. And in only 178 seconds, we're spiraling out of control. And that's the threat that, that the, the, the people that James is writing to are experiencing. So, so let's dig into James chapter 1. We're going to look at the first 12 uh, verses. I, I want you to page 1,216 on the Bibles where you're at. Ma'am, if you would pull out a pen, and just highlight, this is so rich, I, I just want you to take this with you, not only for today, but for the future, so would you just dig in, and we're going to take a look at what James tells people who are going through the clouds and really don't know where they're at anymore. He starts it out this way with an intro, a lot of times these books do, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he doesn't do, he doesn't name drop. In the sense that he doesn't say, well, I'm a brother of Jesus. He doesn't bank on that. Probably one is because he doesn't feel worthy. I mean, yes, he's a brother of Jesus, but he didn't believe in him until, until Jesus had to die on the cross and raise himself from, from the dead. The Father raised him. But he says, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the thing that James wanted to be identified with is not that I'm just a brother of Jesus, but that I am his servant. Servant, by the way, has the sense of slave. It has the bent sense of bond servant. Not a slave as in I'm forced to follow Jesus, but there was a thing in those days you could voluntarily bind yourself to somebody. Just imagine that. Somebody comes up to you and says, I want to bind myself to you. I'm your servant for life. Uh, we we kind of like that idea, right? You know, but that's, that's really what's happening is that, is that James is saying, I'm a bond servant of Jesus. I voluntarily to say he's my Lord. I'm going to follow him. Like a brother doesn't do that unless they're the real thing. And that's what he says. And then he says to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. 12 is a, is a number of completeness in the Bible, but the, there were 12 tribes in the Old Testament. There were 12 apostles. I, I think what James is saying is it's to everyone. This is to everyone. This is to you today. I want you to hear this. This is not just for those people. James did write to that that, that group of people in that day facing persecution, but it was written for all of us, and so that's where we're at. And he says, they were scattered among the nations. Why were they scattered? Because of the persecution. The Roman government was killing people. It was tearing families apart. So what did they do? They took off. What would you do if you're getting killed? You, you're going to run. And they ran. They, they, they got out of Dodge to try to preserve their families and, and live and, and, and preserve their lives. And so what happened was that the gospel, it served to, it served to spread the gospel because it was all centralized, but this dispersion sent people who were followers of Christ to the whole known world. God used something that was very terrible, very destructive, very painful, very tragic. He used it for good. He used it so you and I would hear the gospel. God uses difficult things in your life. Will you let him? Will you let him? 
That, that's what he says. And, and so after a quick idea of who he is, he digs right in. By the way, he doesn't waste time because time's a wasting. Like there are people dying. It's time to give them some truth that will help them. And he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. And we're like, hold the phone. That, I mean, that, that's good stuff so far. Keep it, keep it going whenever you face trials of many kinds. And we're like, wait a minute, what happened to the first line? The first line was really good. The second line, not so what, What's the story with that? Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I think what James is saying is you guys who are facing this persecution, who are going through these trials, who are in the clouds, and you don't know which way is up, you need to have a change of attitude. You need to look at things differently, because otherwise you're never going to have joy. And I think what he's saying is, he's saying begin to consider being joyful when you encounter various kinds of trials. That's what James is saying. Begin to consider being joyful whenever you encounter counter various kinds of trials. And you say, well, why? Well, he gives us the answer right in verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, the real measure of any man or woman is their, in, 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 as a follower of Christ is their faith and their character. Is, do you really believe God is who he says he is? Do you believe he can do what he says he can do? The more and the stronger your faith is, the more you're complete. And your character is another measure. The more you are like Jesus Christ in your character, the more mature and complete you are. And he says that's the ultimate. You see, Jesus cares about your comfort. He cares about the things you're going through. But do you know that he cares even more? about your character and your faith. And he says, I want, I want you to be complete. I, I want you to fulfill your destiny, who, who I've created you to be, your purpose in life. And these trials and these tribulations, they're part of the deal. They're part of what's going to happen. And so here's the strangest thing. Uh, let me go to the next slide here. These difficult experiences develop endurance and a, and a growing faith and character. Okay, I missed a fill in the blank. So you guys who need every fill in the blank, here it is. Write it quick, and then here we go. This is the thing that just struck me this week. I have to admit, this was a whole, it just, I, 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 you know how you never sometimes don't connect the dots as you're reading Scripture? You're like, I don't know, I missed that before. I, how, I just didn't quite see it at that level. I saw that this way. Joy and difficulty is the vital sign James tells us we should monitor when we're going through problems because it tells us if we have the right attitude and if we have the right heart the right heart rhythm as we're going through the trials and the clouds and the difficulties I don't ever I don't know maybe I should have seen that maybe you saw it a long time ago it just struck me in a new way that when we go through these times and, and God wants to use them to grow our character, to, to, to grow our faith so that we glorify God. And when we do that, when we're, when we're in the midst of those moments, you know what happens? We become desperately dependent on him because we realize we can't do it. All of a sudden, we realize we're spiraling out of control and we can't pull this thing off. And in that desperate dependence, when we trust in him, when our faith grows, when we're complete in our character uh, as he grows us, you know what happens? This strange thing called joy begins to come into our life in the midst of the most difficult, tragic times. There's this thing called joy. Now, joy is the inward thing, right? Happiness is the outward things. But joy is that inward thing that we know it's going to be okay in the midst of whatever we're going through. And it just seems backwards, doesn't it? It just seems backwards. How do you have joy in a difficult time? It just seems impossible. You and I, in our natural human self, do you know that's not our bent to have joy in difficulty? That's just not 
what we, how we go. That's not where our minds go. That's not where our attitude goes. And yet James says that's where I want you to go. That's where God wants you to go because he wants to do something special. But what we tend to do is say, why is this happening to me, God? Why would you let this happen? Why, why didn't you stop that? And we begin to ask why instead of what for. Because enduring trials goes against our very bent. So the question today that I want to answer is how, how do we get that wisdom that leads to joy? How, how do we get the kind of wisdom that, that James is talking about here that will then lead to joy because we've faced the trials the way he's called us to? I'm glad you asked. He starts out in this, in verse 5. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom. I, I think that right there just kind of like all of a sudden you have to begin to evaluate your life. Do, where am I at on the wisdom deal? Like, like, okay, let's do a vital sign check. Do I have joy? Not am I happy. Not, not as all the circumstances of life going well, but inside do I know it's going to be okay in spite of all the things that are happening around me? Am I confident God has this thing and that he's going to bring good out of it? And he says, if any of you lacks wisdom. And so if you want to have joy in life, you're going to have to see your great need for God's wisdom and crave it. You're going to have to see your God, great need for God's wisdom and crave it. It's not like James is telling them, well, you, you, you mostly have life all together, but, but in these difficult times, you've got to ask God for help. I, I, I think he's saying probably all the time we need help. We're never as clever as we think we are. We're not as smart as we think we are. We're not as wise as we think we are. Uh, I saw uh, this, or heard about this Facebook post where this, they, they, they put it, there was an image up and the guy, uh, he was just confused as all get out. And there was a caption underneath that said, I'm in this awkward period between birth and death. <laughs> Anybody else there? <laughs> yeah, you're right in the middle, right? Most of us, though, we feel like we can handle most of our problems. I mean, we've kind of figured out how to do life, and, and we can handle the, the, the cranky boss, or we can handle the, you know, when, when, when the car doesn't start, or the kids aren't acting right. Most of, the, most of those normal pressures we can handle. But sometimes there are these things in life, just like the early believers were facing, where the gears get stripped. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the gears are so stripped, you really can't operate anymore. You can't move forward. Like you're flat on your back. You just don't have the, the power to move forward. Like it's, it's, it's been bound up. It's been stripped loose. And it's in those moments we begin to discover that we can't handle it. And James tells us that he wants us to turn to God, to be so desperate for God's wisdom in that moment that we crave what he has for us. You see, we often don't crave what God has for us until we get to the place where we need him the most. But I want you to know that's the place where we always ought to be a desperate dependence for the wisdom of God. And so James says, if. But you know what I think he's really saying? I, th I think he's saying when. I think he's saying since you need wisdom. Begin to consider your great need. And when you realize, I don't have this thing, and I, I'm not able to do this myself, You've come to the place where you're desperate enough to hear what God wants. See, God wants us to choose him and to depend on him and not anything else. And sometimes it's moments like that when the gears are stripped, when we're flat on our back, that we finally let God have the place in our life that we're to have. And it's in those moments that joy begins to spring up because we finally put our faith in someone and in something that really can do something about our lives. You see, the wisdom James is talking about is practically and skillfully living in obedience to God's revealed will in the midst of trials and difficulties. And it takes wisdom to do that. When you're going through the difficulty, when you're going through a trial, when there's chaos, when, when the clouds are all around and you can't see where to go, we need wisdom to skillfully live that trial out. Because you've all seen people crash and burn. You've seen people go the wrong path to make the wrong decisions. Because when you're in the midst of a trial, you're tired, right? You're scared. You're not sure which way to go and which end is up. And we end up often making the wrong decisions. So we need God's wisdom in the midst of these trials. But 
Here's the great news. If we do, joy is a result. You know, in the Old Testament, wisdom was thought of as knowledge. Uh, they would often give, skilled craft, craftsmen would have the wisdom to, to build the temple or to do things. But I want you to know that James is more concerned about building people. You are the temple of God. <laughs> You're where God resides, and, and he wants to build you in a way that you will be complete, not lacking anything. And so he wants you to give you the skill to operate in the chaos and in the strip, strip gears moments of life. And so we're to ask him. We're to ask him. It says here in James 1.5, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If there's one prayer, I know God answers, and I know he answers them all. I really believe he answers them all. He just doesn't always give us what we hope for, right? But he always gives us wisdom. If you ask, he is not stingy, and he will answer this prayer every time. In Proverbs chapter 2, look what it says. Here it is. We must ask for wisdom. It's not just about um, knowing and craving wisdom, but then we have to ask the Father. And I want you to know it's your attitude that does more of the asking than anything. But in Proverbs chapter 2, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. You see, God is the source of wisdom. Not the self-help books, as good as those are. Not anything from this world. You see, the real wisdom we need is revealed from God. It doesn't come it doesn't come from this earth. God puts it in people. He inspires people, but the reality is God is the source of all wisdom. So if you're looking at another place, you're not going to know how to go through the trials. You're not going to know how to be complete. And here's what James wants us to understand. God wants you to grow through something, not just go through it. He wants you to grow through something, not just go through it. What a waste. What a waste if you're going through something today and it's not creating joy in you. What a waste if you're going through something terrible, something tragic, something chaotic, something hurtful, something that, that's a strip the gears kind of moment. You're going through that and that's it. Like no good comes out of it. There's no gain from it. There's, and God doesn't want that for you. So I don't know what you're going through right now, but God doesn't want you to just go through it. He wants you to grow through it. Because that's what's going to bring the dependence and the joy that he's called for you. Warren Wiersbe is one of my favorite authors. Uh, he writes commentaries uh, on the Bible. Uh, he's taught for over 40 years. I mean, the, the guy's just, just good. He's, he's, he's got a pastor's heart, and I love reading his, his, his commentaries. Uh, he, he, uh, he shared about a time when one of his secretaries had, had just gone through a, a, a real bad trial in their life. She had a stroke. And her husband had gone blind. And then he had some medical condition. They had to take him to the hospital. And it was pretty apparent that, that he was probably going to pass in the hospital. And, uh, and so Warren saw her at church the next, uh, you know, in the next few days. And he said, I'm praying for you for strength and, and uh, that, that, uh, that you'll have what you need to get through this. And uh, she said, is, is that all you're praying for? And, uh, and, and he, he was like taken aback. And, and he was like, well, yeah, that, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for strength and I'm praying for the ability to get through it. She said, oh, that's good. But would you also pray that I'll have the wisdom not to waste this? That's someone who understood James chapter 1, verse 5. You see, that's the wisdom God is asking or, or ask, giving us to ask him. That, that's the wisdom that James is saying to ask for. Not just wisdom that's general knowledge, but the wisdom to skillfully navigate the, the trial and the crisis and the, and the strip gears kind of moment you're going through so that you will not just go through it, but you'll grow through it. That you'll become more like the character of Jesus, that your faith and your trust in him will grow, your confidence in who God is will grow, and through all that, you will begin to glorify God in a way that you never have, and you'll become complete and mature. And, and that's what James wants for you. You see, when you do that, you, you begin to measure your joy, and it will go up, because for the first time in your life, in a different way, at a different level, you'll begin to understand that God really is who he says he is, that he can do what he says he can do. And that confidence will 
will create an inner joy that even though the circumstances around maybe aren't all that good, the inner glow, the inner joy of your life will be unmistakable. He, he puts this, uh, a condition, on the asking, though. We're, we're to understand that, that we need his wisdom, and we're to crave it, and then we're to ask for it. But he says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. See, you and I, we have to believe and not doubt. Now, doubt is a word that uh, we, we think it's this intellectual thing, that we just don't understand things, we don't intellectually understand it. But I want you to know that doubt is really about being torn between two choices. It's kind of like being a walking, walking civil war. Um, when you go back to the word about the double-minded, uh, when you look at the Greek, it's really about double-souled. It's about fighting yourself. And that was the most, I, I find the Civil War fascinating. I find it tragic and terrible. Uh, friend against friend, brother against brother, uh, relationships torn and scattered, people that ha have loved each other fighting against each other on different sides. But the reality is that's what James is saying, protect yourself against. Don't be double-minded. Don't be double-souled. See, one part of you says, I want, to, I, want to, I want to do what you want me to do, God. I want you to lead me through this, and I want to have your attitude. I want to approach this your way. And another part of you says, no, I'm, just, I'm going to handle this my own way. I'm going to call an audible, and I'm going to take care of this myself. I don't want to pay the cost. I, I don't want to do what you want me to do. Uh, that's, too, that, that, that's too hard, so I'm going to do it this way. No, I'm just going to run away from all this, whatever it might be. That's where we're at. That's the double-minded, double-souled kind of thing that that he warns us against. James warns us in this moment that God's not going to answer. He says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. See, God doesn't want to be just one of your many options. He wants to be the only option. And he wants you to be desperately dependent on him to come through. And when you do that, when you ask in that way, guess what? He's going to answer that prayer, and you're going to go through that trial, through that difficulty, through that strip gears kind of moment, and he's going to put the gears back on, and he's going to help you come out the other side. And even while you're flying blind, he's going to help you not crash and burn so that you will become complete and mature. And when you do that, there will be a joy in you that you've never discovered before. That, that's God's plan for our lives. And, and look what he says will happen to the person who's not double-souled, who will, who will allow God to give him the wisdom to, to work through these moments, not just go through them, but to grow through them, to grow in character and in faith so, so that we glorify him. He says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life and that, uh, that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That crown of life isn't just in heaven, by the way. Sometimes we get so focused on heaven, we ought to get focused on heaven. Like that is, that, that is a place that God has prepared for us. And not just a place, but it's a, it's a life. It's, but that eternity starts today. Did you know that? That, that, that? that crown of life starts right now for those who fully trust in him. So you have the crown already as you begin to move through. You're not perfected, but God is with you. He's strengthening you. He's helping you. He's giving you the wisdom to work right now. He's with you, and he will be with you for all eternity. He says that, that is what you'll get if you seek me for the wisdom you need in the trial. Anybody want that? Anybody need that? So how do we apply today's message? Because all these messages don't do a bit of good if like, we don't live this out, if we don't like, take steps in our own spiritual life. Well, I'll just tell you, I'm going to give you two. Choose to be single-minded, desperately dependent on God. Decide now, because when you get into the middle of the chaos, when you're tired, when you're hurting, when it's difficult, when you can't see clearly, guess what? You're going to make the wrong decisions. Decide today that, you know what? I'm going to be desperately dependent on God. I'm seeking his wisdom even ahead of getting in the crisis and the trial. You have to decide today. 
And you know how God reveals that truth most often? It's through his word. I've had people come to me and they, they want to get married, for instance. Let's use that for an example. And they, want, they, want, they want to get married and so they, they come and, and, and we find out that, that a follower of Christ is now, they're dating someone who's not a follower of Christ. And, and uh, so we'll ask them, hey, do you, do you want God to bless your relationship, your marriage? And they do. They, they want God's blessing on it. And we'll say, but God's word says that we're not to be equally yoked. And, and when you share that truth with them, that you, you, there's a little double-minded deal going on here. Then there's immediate crisis in their heart. The crisis is that, oh, I want to get married. I don't want to be single. I don't, I don't want to go back through that. Maybe... Maybe they like the idea of being married more than they like the idea of following God. And so they're, they're in the midst of this crisis moment. And, and, and you point, but God's word says that we are not to be unequally yoked. And they have to decide, are they going to be double-minded or double-souled? Are they going to do it God's way and trust his plan? Are they going to trust their own? And I think it's a very practical way for you and I to take a look at our lives and say, are we being double-minded? Are we being double-souled? Or have we decided in every area of our life, even before the crisis begins, even before we get into the clouds, we know what we're going to do? And, and then ask for the skill and the power to live obediently for God in the midst of the trials. Ask him for skill. You see, we need the wisdom to know what to do when we get in. And you and I, we can't do it on our own. So be desperately dependent and ask him for the power to live in those moments. There was a, a young lady named J Johnny Erickson Tata. Maybe many of you have heard of her. Maybe you haven't. Johnny Erickson Tata was 17 years old. She dove into some shallow water and uh, was was. Uh, uh, actually paralyzed. She was paraplegic at that point. And she wrote this about the wisdom God gave her in this terrible tragedy, what seemed to be such a stripped gears moment in her life, about the wisdom God gave her so she could have joy. Listen to this. She said, God engineered the circumstances. He used them to prove himself as well as my loyalty. Not everyone had this privilege. I felt there were only a few people God cared for in such a special way that he would trust them with this kind of experience. This understanding left me relaxed and comfortable as I relied on his love, exercising newly learned trust. I saw that my injury was not a tragedy, but a gift. God was trying to use me to conform to the image of Christ something that would mean my ultimate satisfaction, happiness, and yes, even joy. James wants you to know that if you're in this life, as the proverb says, sparks fly upward. And just as sparks fly upward, trouble will come. There's going to be trouble in all of our lives. There's going to be crises. There's going to be moments when you get in the cloud and you don't know what to do, and you're spiraling out of control, and the gears are stripped. And in that moment, go for the vital sign. How's my joy? And if your joy is low, if you're, if you're not sure, and you're double-minded about what to do, ask God for the wisdom to skillfully navigate this moment in your life as Johnny Erickson Tata because the skill is going to be giving you a new attitude. Attitude. The skill is going to be giving you a new way to look at what God is doing so that you will not just go through it, but you'll begin to grow through it. And, and as, he, as he increases your faith, and as he builds your character to look more like his, and as you glorify God, you know what's going to happen in that desperate dependence? There's going to be a joy that just wells up inside the outside circumstances may not change, but inside, you're going to be realize this is a momentary problem. But my character, my faith, the things that can bring eternal reward now and forever, that comes when I'm not double-minded, but when I'm single-minded and I'm dependent on him. So would you give me the wisdom 
to navigate this trial so that you're glorified and I become who you created me to be. Check your vitals today. How are you doing in that? Thank you for joining the Valley Church today. We invite you to experience our worship celebration in person each Sunday at one of our campuses located in either Piqua or Troy. Services at our campuses begin at 9.15 and 11 a.m. and the dress is always casual. You can learn more about the Valley's wide range of activities, programs, and services by visiting us on the web at thevalley.church. You can also join us weekly each Sunday online at our iCampus or through Facebook Live by clicking those buttons on our website at thevalley.church. People of all ages can experience the excitement and the joy of being part of a growing church that is truly on God's mission, a church where you can belong and discover your purpose in life. We hope to see you soon.